God, we just thank you, Lord, that what you have made us, we thank you, Lord God, that um, it's because of you why we're here are today, and Lord, we thank you, Lord God. We thank you, Almighty God. We thank you, Lord, for your word that we're about to hear, Lord. We thank you, Lord God, for the, uh, the message that you have provided for our pastor. <coughs> so we thank you, Lord God, and we ask you to bless him right now as a congregation. We just thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord God Almighty, we thank you and praise you, Lord, for your mercy and grace on our souls this week, Lord. In your mercy and in your wisdom, Lord, you've uh, caused us to persevere, Lord, through the trials and, uh, of this world. And Lord, by your grace, by your amazing grace, Lord, you continually call us, Lord, to turn our hearts toward you in a greater way, Lord God, that we would turn our back on the vile wretchedness of this world, Lord, and turn unto your glory, Lord, to turn to a path and a life of righteousness that is greater than us, Lord, it is a mercy that you save sinners out of this dark world, Lord, to uh, come together. Lord, in praise, in worship of a great and glorious God who would Amen. go to that cross for us. Amen. So, Lord, may that truth just overwhelm us this morning, Lord. May we become under conviction of your goodness and your glory in a refreshed and greater way. Lord, as we hear your word, Lord, as your word is spoken and as your word is preached, Lord God, change our souls, Holy Amen. Spirit, Lord. Help us to see you in your glory, Lord, that we would live a life, mm. Lord, that would be uh, something that the world would recognize, Lord, that we've walked with you, Lord, and that we've known your great and glory goodness, Lord. So help us, Lord, to change. Help us to see your glory, Lord, and change us, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So we thank you, Lord, where it says in your word that it said of the apostles that uh, they recognized that they had been with Jesus. Amen. And we pray, Lord, that that will be true of us in an ever-increasing yes. manner, Lord. Yes, uh, yes, yes. In an ever-increasing way, even starting today, mm. Lord, that uh, people would take notice that, uh, that we have been with you. Mm. And, Lord, that uh, the blessing of fellowship with you and the blessing of your presence, Lord, which is... Uh, so permeate our lives and our souls and our action and the way in which we walk. And we pray, Lord, uh, for this, Lord, you would change our hearts. You would create in us a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a steadfast spirit within us. Yes, and we praise you for it, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 For those who knew the the late Robert A. Cook, walk yes. with the king, be a blessing today, right? Yeah. <laughs> Nine fifteen every morning. <laughs> it's right, sister. Thank you for that. That's right. That is a uh, may our lights be filled with the light of Christ in that way. That um, the people that we do come across in our life each and every day would know that we've walked with the King in the mercy. Brothers and sisters, we'll be reading to you uh, verses from Ephesians chapter four this morning which you can find on page 1,158 in our Bibles. If you're able, please stand. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient. Bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit. Just as you were called to one hope when you were called... One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father over all, who is over all and through all and in all. <clears throat> but to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he led captives in his train and 
gave gifts to men. What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers, to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful schemings. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into Him who is the head, that is Christ. From Him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. So I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity with a continual lust for more. You, however, did not come to know Christ this way. Surely you heard of him and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, yes. which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, mm. to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Mm. May God bless the reading of his word to your soul. You may Thank see it. Amen. What an awesome section of scripture here in Ephesians 4 and um, the whole book of Ephesians. Um, just gives the blessings that we have being in Christ in the first three chapters and then what this blessing of being in Christ ought to look like on us uh, in verses 4, 5, and, in chapters 4, 5, and 6. So we're continuing a series of messages kind of practicing the basics for an ever-deepening relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ. And the theme of the last few weeks really has been about this highest calling that we have uh, to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. And um, so we have further word here from the Apostle Paul as it relates to that, the title this morning is just, Am I Walking in a Manner Worthy of the Lord? And the central idea is there's a contrast here between the unworthy walk and the worthy walk in the Lord. And so you have your outline there and fill in the blanks. Um, we're going to see the characteristics of the unworthy or the ungodly walk first few verses into the characteristics of the worthy or godly walk. So Lord Jesus again just thank you and praise you Lord for the truth of your word. Thank you Lord for the blessing of your presence being with us here this morning um, in worship. Lord just uh, continue to lead us in worship now as you look at your word that we would hear the truth the truth would set us free Amen. that we'd grow in our understanding of you and that not yet believers may be sitting here 
maybe watching it on YouTube or Facebook Live, <coughs> or that in the futility of their thinking and the darkness of their understanding, that the veil would be removed from their eyes, and that they would see the beauty and the splendor of Jesus Christ, and turn to Him in repentance and faith and be saved. And we ask this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, uh, the contrast between the unworthy and the worthy walk, we see the characteristics of the unworthy or the ungodly walk, beginning here in verse 17. Paul says, So this I say, and affirm together with the Lord, that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk in the futility of their mind. So, Paul here clearly refers back to what he's been saying about our high calling in verse 1. Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you've been called. And we covered that, right? Paul's imploring, beseeching that we would walk, that believers would walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. He kind of ends this section, Lord willing, uh, we'll see this next week when you go to chapter 5, verse 2. He kind of ends this section somewhat with, therefore be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love. Just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us. And offered you a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. So he gives some characteristics here of the ungodly walk, referred to as the Gentiles, the unsaved, the not yet believers, the pagan. Lifestyle, their lifestyle, those who forsake the living God, here in their walking, they're really dead men and women walking, spiritually dead in their trespasses and sins. Like it says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, it says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins. And here's the same thought it says in chapter 2, verse 1, in which you, and he's writing to the church, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. And so there's those living on the planet today who are presently walking in that state of spiritual darkness. And Paul saying to you as, and me as believers in Christ and as the church, we're not to walk in that manner any longer. He says here, he refers to the futility of their mind, it says they're darkened in their understanding. In verse 18, this describes the unworthy walk. They're walking that way because of the ignorance that is in them. They're callous. That means like not even able to feel pain. Like you could go over to the unsaved person. I know you're not unsaved, but go like that. And they wouldn't even feel that they're unsaved. Like the feel of pain of being unsaved. They have no, they're dead to it. Dead in their trespasses and sins. Unless God awakens them ever moves the veil from their eyes that they would see the truth of Jesus. And then, in verse 19, they described as they're practicing every kind of impurity and greediness. But, it says that you would no longer walk <coughs> just as the Gentiles also walk in the futility of their mind. And you know the word walk there refers to making progress, regulating one's life, how one conducts oneself. And the word futility means like that which never succeeds. It suggests being void of a useful aim or goal. It literally means devoid of truth. It's a, it's a, it's a synonym for a word like, that means like empty or amounts to nothing. And we're going to see that later on in 1 Corinthians 15 about those who have believed in vain. That amounts to nothing. We'll, we'll see that under the application here in a minute, a little bit. But the futility of their mind here. Verse 18 says, being darkened in their understanding, they're excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of the heart. And that just frightens me so much for the unsaved person and for the not yet believer, the hardness of the heart. The hardening effect that the gospel has. The hardening effect that sitting in church has. The hardening effect that going to Bible study has upon the unbeliever, the not yet believer. Their heart becomes harder and harder and harder unless they repent and, re and turn to Jesus and say, 
I need to be saved. The hardening of the heart. We'll talk more about that here in a second. Second characteristic, they're ignorant of God's truth. They're in darkness. It literally means they're like covered with darkness. This isn't just like a little bit of darkness. They're like in spiritual, complete darkness. Which sadly is the end for the unsaved person is the darkness of hell and eternal separation from God. Sometimes people say, and I might have said it or thought it, sometimes we'll say, oh, this is just, I'm just living in hell right now. No way, no way. There's light outside, there's sunshine, I mean, not today, but there's sunshine, there's flowers that bloom, there's grass that grows, there's changing of the season, there's the, the, the blessings of this world, of this life on this planet. Um, no comparison to being alone eternally separated from God, a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth, and eternal torment with no escape. So today they can sit there, the person can sit there, or the person can watch this on YouTube and just say, yeah, okay, yeah, mm -hmm. that's, that's, yeah, that's interesting. And the heart can get harder, and, um, and one day it'll be too late for that person to be saved. It says their ignorance. It refers to really moral blindness. It says they're dark in their, in their understanding. Unsaved, not yet. Here's what it is. The unsaved and the not yet believers. We say not yet believers because there's always the hope of a person coming to Christ and being saved and having the value removed from their eyes. But not yet believers, the problem is they have a built-in inability to know and comprehend the things of God. I mentioned in the Sunday school class. I was talking with somebody last week, and they're like, I don't know what God wants me to do in this situation. And I'm, and I'm thinking to myself, they need to know Christ. They need to repent. They need to turn to the Lord and be saved. And so I kind of try to gently push that person in that direction. But they're like, I don't know what God... Well, I know you don't know what God... You're blinded. You're in the fertility of your mind. You're, you're in, I, wish, I actually saw this passage after I talked to the person. I wish I had the kind... I wish I, was think, I wish I saw this and was thinking about this before I saw them last week. It's like, I, I know you're... And you're excluded from the life of God. Repent. Be saved. Turn to Jesus. You're hardening your heart against Him. They have a built-in ability to hear the things of God unless God awakens their heart. And that's the good news, right? Verse 9, uh, it says, because, and the reason why they're like that is because of the hardness of their heart. Unresponsive to God's truth. These are characteristics of the unworthy walk. These are characteristics of the ungodly. The person dead, the person dead in their trespasses and sins, you know that, cannot hear. No matter how hard you shape them, or how loudly you say it, or even how clearly it's said. Not that we don't try to say it loudly enough, not that we don't try to say it clearly enough, but they can't hear it. That's a characteristic that they're not saved. They can't hear it. <laughs> Until God awakens them. Then when you say the very same thing, and maybe you might even say it a little more softly, a little more gently, and they'll be like, I need to be saved. You may say it even loud, poorly, not that well, not that, artic not that articulate. And they're like, I need to be saved. I need to turn to Jesus. I need to repent. Because their darkness has been removed. It says in verse 19, this gets, you know, serious. Further, it gets, it's like, futility of their mind, darkened of their understanding, excluded from a life of God. I mean, that's a pretty... Serious thought, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. And then there, it's like a further, you're, you're further away from the truth, and they become callous, have given themselves over to sensuality, to the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. Calluses that cease, can't feel pain. The third characteristic of a person walking in a manner unworthy of the Lord is spiritual, immoral, callousness. It refers to, 
I meant to bring my rock in here as an illustration. I forgot, but you got a rock, and it's like the heart being like rock hard, like rock solid, like um, hardened, callous. It was used by physicians to describe the calcification that forms around the bones that they could become harder than the bone itself. You know? It's used of joints which become immobile. And Satan, we know, plays a part. <coughs> Satan, we know, plays a part in the blindness of those who refuse to believe. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4. Let me start with verse 3. And even if our gospel is veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing. Veiled. Can't see it. It's, an, it's one of the evidences that they are unseen. They can't see it. It's veiled to those who are perishing. And in the case, in whose case the God of this world, Satan, the devil, has blinded the mind of the unbelieving so that they will not see the light of the glory, the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. They're blind. But God has the power. We sang that chorus or by Jeremy came about the same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in us. God can remove that veil. God can remove that darkness. I don't know, is this new? Oh, I'm not very observant. Is this kind of new? This, I think you have kind of a new banner over here, worship banner. I think that's relatively new, maybe just this week. It could have been there for a month and I just saw it today. But anyways, it says, we have seen his glory, right? The gospel, that's why we have great hope and why we preach the word and why we share the gospel, right? We have great hope that that veil, we know that it's the power of God into salvation. To all who believe in the veil can be removed and they can see the light of the glory of God, the light bulb could go on, whatever illustration you want to use. But he describes here their spiritual condition further. They give themselves over to sensuality. And we got a we got an admonition here from Paul it says, You don't we you as believers are to walk in this manner. This is not to be the habit of, uh, of the propensity of the way in which you continually walk. In the futility of your mind, being darkened in your understanding, in sensuality, absence of moral restraint, especially in the area of sexual sin, and that's um, so prevalent. It's always been prevalent, so prevalent. For the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness, and greediness is like just unbounded covetousness. It just it, the greediness there just describes the. The person who's never satisfied with their sin, always craving more sinful lusts, more sinful pleasures, just craving more, and they're just given over to it more. Then he says here in verse 20, though, you didn't learn Christ this way, if indeed you have been taught in him, just as the truth is in Jesus. So, but you, you, but and you, stand in contrast to the unsaved person, to the person who has not come to know Christ. Those who have learned Christ are those that are saved, those who have a relationship with him. And I don't know, who was it, Spurgeon? I think it was Spurgeon, might have been somebody, others used the same phrase, but he says, believers where students enrolled in the school of Christ. And we've learned, we've been saved, and we are learning. So that enrollment began when he saved us, and learning Christ is something that is to be continuing, right, on an ongoing basis in the life of a believer. Verse 21 says, If indeed you've heard him and have been taught in him, just as truth is in Jesus. So there's that connection between verses 20 and 21. Those who have <coughs> learned Christ, those who have been taught by Christ, if indeed you've heard him and have been taught in him. And then he begins with these um, admonitions in verse 22, kind of making the transition between the unworthy walk ungodly walk and the worthy walk and the godly walk, but verse 22 says that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit. And um, this laying off, this putting off is um, really in a tense 
the tense of the, of the words is, it's referring to, you know, really something that's already happened in the past, what it looks like on the believer in the present, okay? And so, yes, we lay aside, yes, we put off the old self, but it's really referring to that which has already happened to us when we were saved. And now, it's to become the, the pattern of what it looks like on the life of the believer and the, the tenses of the verbs that are really in the infinitive. It's not even really an imperative. It's an infinitive referring to that which is like already happened. Kind of like what Paul says in Romans 6, 6 when he says, knowing, it's like this thought, knowing this, that your old self <coughs> was crucified with him in, a, in order that your body might be done away with sin so that you would no longer be slaves to sin for he who has died is free from sin. And then in Romans 6, where it continues the thought of slaves, no, sin should no longer be your master. You have victory over it. Uh, where am I? Let me go back to Romans 6. Don't let sin reign. It's the same kind of thought here as in Romans 6 and as in Ephesians 4. Therefore, don't let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lust. Don't go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness. Or present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not be your master, for you are not under law, but under grace, Paul says there. So there's a contrast between the unworthy walk and the worthy walk. Now let's look at the characteristics of the worthy walk, beginning with verse 22 and 23, that in reference to your former manner of life, Lay aside the old self. Again, putting into practice who we are spiritually speaking. We have victory over sin. We have victory over the flesh. We don't have to keep doing the very thing we hate. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 8 says there's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Paul says, walk in the Spirit and you will not satisfy the desires of the flesh. So lay aside it, um, the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit. And I guess for sure how we do that is, verse 23, instead be renewed. Instead be renewed in the spirit of your mind. So that's where the spiritual victory over the flesh is won. Where does that renewal take place in the in the spirit of the mind, in your mind. The, the renewed, the verb renewed there, different than where it says lay aside or put off and where it says put on. Where that actually refers to lay aside and put on, put off, refers literally to an action that's already happened at the cross. And now we're going, going to, as we're being renewed in the spirit of mind, we're growing in that. Again, so we have just great hope for victory over the flesh. Okay, because of what Christ has done and the power that he has. It's the power of the gospel. It's the power of God for all those who are saved. It's the power of God delivering us from the penalty of <coughs> sin, the presence of sin, currently the power of sin in our life. But renewed isn't like a one-term, one-time act, but is a present durative, meaning that the process of renewal is continuous there. Okay, in the life of the believer. Putting off has happened, more or less, already. The renewal is a continual process, and it's progressive as we're surrendered and as we are submitting to Christ. And so this is why we can walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. And we know we sin, and we know we still fail, as we have an advocate, and he says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we need to learn how to be through the power of the Spirit being renewed in the spirit of our mind. That's where the that's where the problem begins, right? Is in our mind. Or with something that we think. Or we, and, and, and where we go with those thoughts is, is critical. Verse 24 says, and put on, putting off or putting on, and, uh, the new self. which is in the likeness of God, has been created in righteousness and the holiness of truth for being made like God. What a stagnant truth that is. All right, so let's go to applying.
abundant truth. So to the unbeliever, to the not yet believer, to the one who's in that spiritual state of hardening, you know, like hardening of the arteries? Like the plaque builds up in the arteries. That's why they have the cholesterol lowering medication, you know, to, to keep that plaque from building up so that you don't, it doesn't clog and you have a heart attack. There's a hardening effect that sin has in the life of the unbeliever. Unbelievers need the veil of that spiritual darkness and spiritual news to be removed from their eyes by Christ. Praise God, he, he does that. But their minds, there's the futility of the thinking of the unsaved person again, their minds were hardened. For until this very day at the reading of the Old Covenant, the same veil remains unlifted because it is removed by Christ. But to this day, whenever Moses is read, or the law, a veil lies over their heart. But whenever a person turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Amen. Amen. What great hope there is of that, right? When a person turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. When a person recognizes their sin and turns to Christ, the veil is taken away way, the veil. Unbelievers need that veil of spiritual darkness. To be, I remember bap, not baptizing, I remember dedicating um, one of my sister's children. This is like years and years ago. And it was kind of interesting that she asked me to do a baby dedication for her, knowing you know, she'll never see this on YouTube, so it's okay, whatever to say here. But, but I remember holding her, I remember which one of my nieces it was, and I remember holding her and saying we're dedicating this child to the Lord and, and it was really, the baby dedication is really the dedication of the parents saying they're going to raise up this child in the fear and admonition. It was at Nogadet Valley Community, you might have been there, Gene. It was at Nogadet Valley Community Church where I did this and I'm holding her and I said, I wish I could say something that would save my niece. Or, you know, not that I don't want the power to be in me, but the picture there that the churches that baptize infants and they think that's what saves a person. That's not what saves a person. Remember, I wish I could. If I could, I would save my niece. But it's like God has to open up their eyes and God has to open up their hearts that they can, that they can see Christ. It's what happened in Matthew 27, 51. Remember? After the resurrection, and behold, the veil of the temple. Imagine if this could happen today for someone sitting here today who's unsaved, who's a not yet believer, and it is all of a sudden they recognize this and their need for Jesus, and they're saved today, or someone watches this on YouTube, and it'd be like this moment happening for him for them. And behold, the veil of the temple, it says here, was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split, and the tombs were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. That You know that the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom after Jesus was resurrected, meaning that now there's access to God. Now there's a means by which we can be saved. And that's what has to happen in the heart and life of the unsaved person. And it says they'll, they turn to the Lord in the veil is taken away. Okay, next one, Dan. This is still to the unbeliever and the not yet believer. Self-examination. Am I excluded from the life of God? Psalm 14, 1 says, The fool has said in their heart, there is no God. The characteristic of a person excluded from the life of God is that they don't know that they're excluded from the life of God. And this is where it concerns me for the um, unsaved person who's professing to be saved. Their life doesn't give any evidence that they are saved. This is where there's a concern here for people in that spiritual condition. Ecclesiastes chapter 10. 
The wise man's heart directs himself toward the right, but the foolish man's heart directs him toward the left. Even when the fool walks along the road, his sense is lacking, and he demonstrates to everyone that he is a fool, an unsaved person, or describing the spiritual condition of any one of us before Christ saved us as being a fool, excluded from the life of God, dead in their trespasses and sins, darkened in their understanding. Proverbs 1, 7 says, here's the, here's the way of escape from that spiritual condition. It says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, and fools, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. There's the gospel right there in Proverbs 1, 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, where a person hears the gospel, and they hear the truth, and they hear the fact that they've sinned, and they're, and, and, they're, and they're recognizing, that's what was happening when Jonathan Edwards was preaching that sermon, Sinners in the Hand of Angry God, and he's preaching about the wrath of God coming, and the people were like, felt like they were hanging on to the, their pews, they were going to fall into the pit of hell in any, in any moment. And that describes the spiritual condition of the not yet believer. That describes the spiritual condition of the person whose heart, even today, could be coming harder and harder to the things of God. And Edward said in that sermon, the only thing that's keeping that person out of hell is like they're dangling over, like being held out of the pit of hell by like a spider's web. You know, that a spider's web is. Just, and the people in the pews there are just like aghast over that, crying out to be saved. Still along this line here, the next slide says, because of the futility of an unbeliever's mind, because of the futility of your mind, have you believed in Jesus in vain? I have to put this here. Because it goes along with what that word futility means. Empty, void of truth, void of meaning, amounting to nothing. Like what it says in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 from 2. Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel, which I preach to you, which also you receive. So the person who saved, gospel is preached. Here, it's being proclaimed this morning. The gospel is being proclaimed this morning. It's being preached. A response to it would be, to which also you received. Like it says, for by grace you have been saved, through faith and that not of yourselves, as the gift of God, not of works, as anyone should, be, should boast. Or it says in it says in John 1, 12, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. So the unsaved and not yet believer hears this, we hear, and they receive it. Yes, I recognize this. That's me. You're describing me. I need Jesus. Then the person who's saved says, with which you also stand, by which you are saved, <coughs> if you hold fast the word which I preach to you, unless you believe in vain. And so again, there's that whole category of people who have believed in vain. They're the ones that are, God's going to say to them, depart from me. I never knew you. He's saying that to people who profess to be followers of Christ. He says, I never knew you. A perfect verse for this believing in vain to no saving effect is Titus chapter 1. Verses 15 and 16. To the pure, all things are pure, but to those who are defiled, that describes the ungodly, the unsaved person, here that we're talking about in Ephesians, and unbelieving, nothing is pure, but both their mind and their conscience are defiled. You hear that again, the futility of their thinking. Now listen to verse 16. They profess to know God. But by their deeds, they deny Him, being detestable and disobedient and worthless for any good deed. So this is the heart, the heart that's hard, the heart that's callous, the heart that's turned away from the Lord. And they, they end up in this place. Jeremiah 8.20 says, Harvest is past, summer is ended, and we are not saved. So the response is for that person, repent 
and believe the gospel and turn to him and he will save you. All right, next one is children of God. Now we talk to the to, uh, to, to children of God. We are his workmanship. All praise, glory, and honor go to him. That's Ephesians 2.10, right? We walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. We can walk in a manner worthy of the Lord because he saved us. And Ephesians 2 says, says, 10 says, We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. And I love that word there, workmanship. It means like poem. It means um, something that was created. And it just gives praise and glory and honor to the Lord Jesus Christ that we are his workmanship. We are his poem, so to speak. Um, it's a matter of his grace and mercy that enables us to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. I'm going to come back to that workmanship at the end here. So the next slide says, am I supposed to call it a slide? What do I call it? Yeah, slide? Yeah, just doesn't seem, I, I, you know, I have visions of something else when I think of a slide. <laughs> put on the new person! Back to Ephesians 4, 24, and put on the new self. You have the ability by the power of Jesus Christ and because he saved you, and because you belong to him, you have the, it's like you've already put it on, so to speak, at your conversion, okay, to Christ, and now you have the capacity and the ability through the power of the Spirit to walk in the Spirit, not satisfy the desires of the flesh. So come on, put it on. Put on the new person, the new self, which is in the likeness of God, has been created in righteousness and the holiness of truth. Yeah. Amen. And we do that. The next one, we put on a new person by being renewed in the spirit of our mind and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Remember the contrast, the fertility of the thinking? You know, um, you all know Romans 12. 1 through 2. And you got to get as soon as the thoughts enter into the mind, you know, before the heart acts on it, before the heart dwells on it and the will acts on it, you want to get it right there in the, in the seedbed of your thought, and it's like, take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. Help me, oh, this is not who I am. Help me to turn from this. Help, you know, and Romans 12 1 through 2 says, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, you know, putting off and putting on, is like present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. So this, like we're in a worship service now, right? This is the easiest time, I think. It's easy to worship at 11, whatever time it is now. We're in the worship service, and it's easy to worship. You know, we're sitting here with our Bibles, we're singing praises, we're praying, we're worshiping God. That verse says, when we go out through those doors, and we get in our cars, and we get on the road, and we go wherever we're going, and we're in our home, and we're in our workplace, with all that stimuli that's out there that could draw us away from Jesus. There's not a lot of stimuli in here really drawing us away from Jesus, except for your mind. Our mind could be just off somewhere, which is... But all the, the world, the flesh, and the devil, and all the stuff out there, those are opportunities for what Romans chapter 12, verse 1 says, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. There's where that rubber hits the road, where there's opportunities to worship Christ, right, in our homes, in the workplace, out there. And don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, great verses about the renewing of the mind and the spiritual work that God is doing in us. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. We all, with unveiled face, 
beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed. Right there when the thought hits you is the opportunity for spiritual transformation to take place. If we take it captive and if we are obedient and repentant, we we'll be transformed by the renewing of our mind, even before the sin happens. And after sin happens, then we still could be transformed by the renewing of our mind as we confess and as we repent. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16. Therefore, don't lose heart. So when you struggle with sin, and it might, we don't lose heart, it says, therefore, in 2 Corinthians 4, 16. Don't lose heart. Though our outward man is decaying, yet our inward man is being renewed day by day. Day by day being renewed. And then a great place to fall back to is praying Psalm 51, verse 10. Create in me a clean heart, O God. And what? And renew a steadfast spirit within me. Don't cast me away from your presence. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. And sustain me or uphold me with a willing spirit. God is the one who does that in the life of a believer. So, there's a contrast between the worthy and the unworthy walk. We saw the characteristics of the unworthy walk, the characteristics of a worthy walk. So the simple question is, am I walking? I tried different ways of saying this. Like, am I presently walking in a manner worthy of the Lord? Is there some area in my life where I'm really struggling to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord? And how the Lord would have us respond to Him in the midst of that. Right? And just going to Him. And just remembering who we are in Christ. Calvin, the quote for the week, I wish you could do that too. Calvin wrote, He whose life differs not from that of unbelievers has learned nothing of Christ. For the knowledge of Christ cannot be separated from the mortification or death of the flesh. We didn't really talk about that, but that's like, you know, killing sin before it kills up. There's that mortification part, the death of flesh, our flesh life, our sin life, right? Putting to death the deeds of the flesh. Ephesians 4, verse 20. If indeed you've heard him and have taught him, just as the truth is in Jesus, that in reference to your former man of life, you lay aside your old self, which was in accordance with the lust of deceit, and you be renewed in your spirit of your mind, and put on the new self, which is in the likeness of God, has been created in righteousness and holiness of truth. So our walking in a manner worthy of the Lord is meant to make much about Jesus. So, closing illustration. Some of you know who the artist is who painted this, so don't say it yet. But, um, the picture, remember what I said before, we are created, in, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, that we would walk in good works. We are his workmanship, we are his um, poem. And the purpose of that is to bring reflection and glory to God, not to ourselves. Like in a painting, you want to know like, who the artist is, like, okay, who, who painted this painting? But, you know, that's fine. But the point about our being saved and walking in a manner worthy of the Lord is to bring reflection and bring and point to the one who's done the work. And that's to God. That's to Jesus. Where he receives the praise and the glory. As the artist, if you want to put it that way. The one who's created us in him for good works. We are his workmanship. So... I remember reading about an art, a guy who was the president of some university and they painted a painting of him and they hung it up in the hallway and he's like, I don't want the painting to be like a reflection of, oh, that was the president, look what, look what he's done. I want the painting to be a reflection of even like, look at what the cool uh, a painter was and painting it. And Jesus is the one who's the one that we want to receive the glory and the honor and the praise. We are his workmanship. So I ain't going to tell you who painted this painting. <laughs> 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 
Somebody just gave it away back there. <laughs> Anyways. So Jesus, just thank you and praise you for um, the walk that you enable us to walk. And we can walk in a manner worthy of you. We pray, Lord, for the unsaved. We pray for that not yet believer. We pray for the one whose heart gets harder. It says in the Bible, there comes a point where they're just given over. I didn't read any of those verses in Romans. They're, just, they're given over to the hardness of their heart, to the depravity of their thinking. They're just given over. And there'll come a point where it is too late. And the harvest will be passed. And the summer will be ending. And they will not be saved. There comes a point of no return, so to speak. When the hardness of the heart just overtakes the person. I've seen, we've seen people like that who just reject Christ to that degree. And Lord, we pray that before that spiritual calcification takes place and the hardness of the spiritual arteries grow harder, that a person, Lord, would be saved and that they would turn to Jesus Christ today and cry out to Him and ask Him to save him or her. Lord, we pray. And then for the un uh, for believers in Christ. We thank you, Lord, for the walk that we are enabled by you to walk. Help us to walk in a manner worthy of you, fitting of who you are, that we would walk with the King today and be a blessing. Mm -hmm. We ask this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Um,